I want to show you around our primary initial enterprises and why we planned those. I put a lot of work in my book into a comparative analysis of all the different sort of enterprises you might find in a small farm, looking at the investments needed, the time needed to run these enterprises and what sort of hourly rate they pay you out compared to the sort of land use you need. Because most of the young people coming into farming that don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of land and they haven't got a background in farming. So this is a part of what I was trying to do is give people recipes like, okay, you've got 15 acres, you've got $50,000 to put in and you need $30,000 to run your young family. Okay, well, look, here are two or three things that might work. Everything else, it's not gonna work for you. Like you need more land or more money or whatever it is. So on our farm, we wanted to choose things that you could start up for like $20,000 and pay that back and make a profit straight away. So we started with pasture broilers because that's for sure one of the most profitable animal enterprises you can run. It's a model popularized by Joel Salatin that we've just adapted to European regulations and our climate. We buy day old chicks, run them in brooders for three weeks indoors. Then they go straight out onto pasture into Salatin pens that have been made much lighter, easier to use and a bit more weather protection for our climatic zone. Then move for the next five weeks out on pasture. We have to do our own salmonella testing, et cetera, because we have zero salmonella tolerance here in Sweden. And they are integrated with the egg laying hens and cows and sheep as they move through our grazing plan. We've also been looking at ways to scale these enterprises. This is a thousand meat birds or $35,000 of chicken. This is the morning move where now one person can move a thousand chickens in 10 minutes flat because chickens have their own feet. They can move themselves. And we just put up those salads and pens on bicycle wheels and pour the feed down the middle and pull the shelters over them. So we're always playing with time and motion studies, how to do these things to, to fit them into uh, a reasonable time frame that you know we can reduce the farming week down to a sensible amount like 55 hours that's a that's a nice goal for a farmer it's not a nine to five job obviously and then talking about food miles or food kilometers like this is the one bad day as joel would call it we use an atv that's what powers our farm and we literally carry the birds a few hundred yards up the road to our slaughtery which is one of europe's cheapest approved slaughter facilities we just kitted this out uh, with um, vinyl paneling and scrap material that we could find. And then we bought in a couple of tools and now we have a beautiful space where we can legally process layers, broilers, turkeys, rabbits, anything like that. And it completes the cycle of a product that we can bring to the customer. It allows us to make the money for the work that we did rather than some middleman. And this is also inadvertently a training center in some regards because there aren't really anywhere, there's no places in Europe where you can go and learn how to process chicken in a legal facility. They won't let you in it, you know. So it's, it's become a little springboard for people going off to start their own enterprises because you can't learn this sort of stuff at ag school, unfortunately. This is used for our laying flock. When the laying flock is switched out every year, we can sell those birds as stewing hens or uh, render them down into stock. So it's a very useful thing to have on the farm. And there's not really any competition for this enterprise because all of the chicken in Sweden is just industrial farm. There is no alternative. And the, uh, some of our students are now becoming our competitors, but we like that. That's the, the aim is to make ourselves obsolete with that. But we've really been able to build this stuff up fast and cheap by intercepting waste streams. So we went off to buy mulch for our tree systems and we found piles of wood 100 yards long by eight yards high. And they're like six yard boards, all different dimensions. And the trouble is Sweden they have massive Volvo trucks that run their timber yards. And when they knock over an industrial pallet, they don't have employees to pick it up. So they just pile it up, chip it up, burn it. So we come along and take it off their hands and we build structures for people. We mulch our gardens. We build beehives. We build slaughteries and barns and eggmobiles and places to camp out and places to house people, places to wash people. So this has been like a farm accelerator fund for us. It's just intercepting waste. And one of the beauties of living in such a rich country is that the waste is always amazing quality. I found a brand new steel chainsaw in the dump that just needed a air filter change. 
that's what you get for living in in a rich country i guess here's a palette of you know this this is perfectly good structural timber for a building that's just gone gray on the ends because the plastic didn't cover it and we just paid the delivery cost. So it's been amazing uh, at getting us going in a really low cost way. This is a bulletproof uh, greenhouse. This is actually our survival bunker for when shit hits the fan as it were. And this is actually bulletproof glass from the police station in Stockholm built with free timber. The only thing we paid for is paint and a few cinder blocks. And now we've got an earth sunken greenhouse that we can start all our plants in subarctic conditions. This is a smoker for our poultry. It costs $200 to build using a thrown out sauna heater. And now we can take birds that are damaged in the plucking machine and we can double their value by turning them into premium smoked chicken. So it's a wonderful way to start closing all these loops and getting rid of waste, that's a big part of what we're doing on our farm. Looking at the financials of the boiler enterprise, it's a low cost startup. Now that's $28,000 invested, including the whole slaughter facility. Now you, you can't do, in America, you can do things outdoors and in quite simple ways, like I'm sure most people have seen Joel Salton set up. You can't do that in Europe, it's totally not allowed in our regulations. So you have to invest a bit more, but you can still do it really low cost. We have a, we're very rural, and I think one of the most impressive things about our farm is that we are very rural. We're not near a big population center at all. So we max out at four, four and a half thousand birds. We, I, I've translated these figures because I'm guessing most listeners will be American, but uh, I'm familiar with kilos and euros myself. But you can see it's a very um, profitable enterprise and it all fits within six months now we can choose to sell the product over 12 months to even out our customer base um, but it's one that the field operations are done in six months this one doesn't meet organic standards because in europe boilers have to be 84 days old to be certified organic you know in my eyes local food is not just about local inputs and outputs it's about local decision making and i don't need someone in brussels who writes paperwork and has never raised chickens telling me a poultry expert when should i slaughter my bird so we choose not to be organic certified we choose to be customer certified it's much better for us in the long run but we're working to organic standards generally other than that point we do some pasture turkeys, but not many. We don't have a Thanksgiving or a Christmas turkey tradition here in Sweden. They like to eat rotten fish and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's not a big market, but this is a wonderful enterprise. Turkeys are voracious grazers. They'll take 40% of their diet off pasture. They're a lot more comical and fun to be around, and they're more profitable than broilers. But if you've got a Thanksgiving market and you know an open market to pasture broilers, it's a wonderful enterprise. I really enjoy that one. But that's a sideline thing for us. Our second main enterprise, and it's a poultry one again, is our eggmobiles. This is the Ridgedale style eggmobile that people have taken all over the world now. And I told them not to. It was very specifically built for our time place and circumstance but it works very well so this is a 1500 euro a 1500 dollar structure that kicks out thirty thousand dollars of eggs a year so we're recycling scrap and we're making simple low-cost roll away nest boxes because here in europe you're not allowed to wash eggs so you need to have clean eggs all the time and that rolls around the fields with simple electric fence we have an electric uh, mobile energizer and then these 300 foot gas reels so this this is like propane pipe that's a lot more resilient to being pulled around the field and it's very thin bore so you can fit 300 foot of it on a little reel and that's a very nice little mobile setup you can fit 350 birds in each of these uh, eggmobiles and we try and time it four days behind the cows here in our climate that's when we can interrupt the fly cycle and get the omega-3 and 6 uh, rich maggots but in theory that's very nice but it doesn't always work out mathematically because the hens are on a fixed size rotation whereas the cows have bigger and smaller paddocks depending on our grazing plan but a nice example of the symbiosis that can go on with multiple species when you bring a species of animal onto a piece of land you create an ecological niche for up to seven more creatures and when you bring 10 different farm animals to a piece of land you're really creating a haven for habitat, uh, habitat for wildlife to move back into. And we've got three pairs of nesting 
predator birds moved into our little 25 acre farm and that for me is a a high sign of success when we've got healthy populations of wildlife moving in because we're an island worth landing on. Healthy chickens are a great gateway product. If you've got good eggs, people will come back every time for them. You have to really piss them off if, if you want to stop them coming and shopping with you. We've got people sending us photos of their fried eggs, their omelets, and I get a lot of egg photos. <laughs> uh, this is how we collect the eggs, uh, just a simple ATV. And then this is an egg packery. So this is a certified official stamped egg packery. We swapped it for three meat chickens. Having meat chickens is a great currency. It has to have hot and cold running water and mouse traps, smoke alarms, things that go beep and all this stuff. But it's very simple. Like what I found my journey with regulations is that it always seems overwhelming before you've done it. And then when you've done it, it's just like, ah, that was easy. It's just bureaucratic kind of nightmares you have to navigate. But once someone's done it, it's much easier for other people to do that. So, you know, if you're thinking of starting up any of these kind of things, I can't stress enough how important it is to go and connect and meet people who have already done it because it just reassures you and makes you confident of your investments and efforts. Now, we say pasture poultry, but for for six months, it looks like this. So birds have to come in. They go into the polytunnel and they go onto a deep litter system with bedding. We put their nest box up on stilts because that will be two and a half foot thick in bedding at the end of that. And then we time it with the arrival of our new flock for their bad day so that we keep a constant stream of production with our eggs so that we can uh, keep customers satisfied and we work on a subscription sales model. So that's quite important for us. We dig that up with a front loader and put it in windrows, and that produces up to 100 yards of compost that we can put uh, on our market garden. So we become self-sufficient with compost from the farm. And then in the summer months, that grows us a thousand tomato plants in there. So multi-use infrastructure is really important. We, you know, we put a lot of money into building up the farm, so we want that money to be doing as many jobs that infrastructure to be doing as many jobs as possible to make that money back and you know help feed us this is a super low cost enterprise eleven thousand dollars to build three of these egg mobiles and that can turn over 130,000 euros of eggs in the first year we get an average lay of 85 percent across the whole year it's up to 95 all summer and it goes down in the winter and we sell eggs for 41 cents excluding tax now that's in line with organic eggs in our country the the meat chickens i showed before they're actually cheaper than certified organic meat industrial birds that you find in the supermarket so our prices might be shockingly expensive for some of you depending on what country you're listening to but they are no more than the organic prices you pay in the supermarket here so sweden's a very expensive country this one meets organic standards and then that brings us to our last main enterprise so pasture boilers pastured layers and market gardening are the three mainstays that make up our bread and butter they pay our employees they pay our salaries all the other things are things to feed us or to make supplemental income so charles dowding really gave us no dig market gardening and we bought the addition of wood chips in pathways to really produce even more ecological benefit and some other practicalities and then we've just tried to marry the best soil care with the best planning and the best tools hand tools for doing this job we started in total no dig fashion putting composted manure that we could get for free from the neighborhood straight onto the lawn we're putting cardboard under the pathways here and we've also tilled beds and then put down put those into no dig afterwards now this approach has been incredible for me i've been growing no digs since i was about 18 so over 20 years now but the art and science of it has refined over time and this addition of wood chips has been so useful because this land that you see in the bottom left is underwater in the spring it was is very heavy clay and it's where the neighbor used to keep their forestry machines, really heavy machines, very compacted. And interestingly enough, that wood chip soaks up. So what we do is we put down a lot of compost in the beginning, but we fill those pathways up so that everything is level on the surface. And so you've got this massive sponge on the soil surface. So that remains moist all year, but it doesn't 
get waterlogged. So you can walk around here in gym shoes all year and you've got dry, clean feet. And the another, I mean, that's psychologically very nice, but it keeps the crops clean because there's no water splashing soil back up onto leaves. So we do very minimal washing. We don't have to wash many of the crops. And also as a happy consequence, it's incredibly beautiful. Like we spend very little time weeding and watering. I think we spend six hours weeding this whole garden. This is 1500 square meters or 16,000 square feet, I guess. And, and that's, it's producing a hundred shares. We used to sell vegetable shares, but now we sell in a different way I'll tell you about. But um, it's a great marketing piece. This is the first thing you see when you come into the farm and it's beautifully well kept and it looks stunning. And it's like, well, if our vegetables are that beautiful, then obviously our chicken is the best too, right? That's kind of how it translates in the, the customer's mind too. So it's a beautiful, happy consequence of this approach. So really beautiful way to deal with annual vegetable production for small scale. You know, this is not obviously practical on big field scale productions. Like all the best market gardeners, it's all standardized beds. These are 30 foot beds, 30 inches wide, because that's what Elliot Coleman started developing all these great hand tools with that have been taken on by people like Jean Martin and others and made popular all over the world now. I won't talk so much about it because I'm sure many people are well versed in those things. A great other benefit of this wood chip system is that we can inoculate these pathways with choice edible mushrooms. This is wine cap stropharia or king stropharia. And we use about 50 cubic meters of wood chip every five years. That's a, the time it takes for us to have to replenish it. And we can produce three or four tons of edible mushrooms in the gap between the pathways and the beds. And they're breaking that wood chip down into soil that can be put back into the system and new wood chip put down. So lots of scope for beautiful, functional, healthy plants and nice environments to work in. And it leads to very healthy soil systems, which lead to very healthy plants, which means we don't get pests and diseases. We use very intense spacings. So we've armored the soil with compost, and then we've armored the compost with intensely spaced plants. And then when we cut the crops out, we will leave the root systems in the ground in nearly all the crops we grow. So you have this massive feeding of the soil food web. And that's really beneficial because it's basically led to taking all that organic material right down up to 60, 70 or two foot down into the ground. So we got nature digging for us and they obviously do a better job than humans with forks and spades, etc. And we just get very healthy, deep rooting plants as a consequence. Uh, I just want to show you our water system because it's a very nice uh, feature. Uh, we only have a short well in our property and that's used for slaughtery and for people that come on trainings. We have to have a lot of expensive water tests to feed people. So that water is quite precious and it runs out in summer. So we dug a stream fed well, but I wanted to show you this material because it's such a, a beautiful thing. This is geosynthetic or GCL clay liner. It's basically bentonite clay sandwiched between two layers of geotextile and needle punched together. Now, if you have enough clay in your soil that you can make earthen dams, then that's the way to go. But if you don't, like we didn't, this is by far the best material you can build ponds with on earth. It's about $5 a square yard. It's as cheap as butyl pond liner. And the beauty of this is that you can just join it together by overlapping it a foot and putting a little bit of clay in between. Or you can see the overflow pipe. You just cut a hole stick a pipe through and it will seal up around it. And you could even stick an iron bar through it and it will seal up around that. And the beauty of it is that it swells eight times its thickness. And when you've got that swelling underneath the weight of the topsoil that you put back on after the excavation, it just is a totally uh, impenetrable surface. It will last for, they don't even know how long it lasts because this never failed and it's clay, so it'll last forever. And the beauty of that putting back topsoil is you can plant it out. This is that pond six weeks later. That pond is stocked with brown trout. It's got ducks. It's got aquatic plants. And now you've got a fertile, oxygen-rich living water that we spread up onto our plant systems. And that's the way we like to do, functional interconnections between the different systems on the farm. I told you about our bomb-proof greenhouse. This is the, the safest space on the farm. 
And because it's so cold here in the winter, we've got to stack up in space. And you see, we've got these grow racks with lights because we don't have enough sunlight in the winter to grow through the winter or even in the spring when we're starting our vegetables. It's too dark up here because we're so far north. So this is a room that's situated on the side of the house and it's where the wood stove that heats the house is. So we have a little fan on a thermostat and we heat the whole greenhouse with the wood stove that's on heating our house anyway. Over here in Europe, we don't have a tradition of burning propane or whatever to heat tunnels, etc. And I know um, there's many other good solutions for this. I know, I think Rob, you actually did a, a nice thing with passive greenhouses, lots of solutions for this kind of thing. Uh, we had an excess of heat from our wood stove, so we decided to use that. But small, compact space, really cheap to heat, and that's big enough to grow the starts for our 16,000 square meter garden. And to do that smart, we use tessellating trays. So this is paper pot trays in this example. Two of them fit on one of these shelves. Or we use these really high quality plastic trays from Sweden that come in different uh, cell sizes that tessellate three onto a shelf. So we're just maximizing the use of the space in every way that we can. We do some transplanting with the paper pot system. It's a very effective system I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And so we're just trying to find the right tools to make these repetitive jobs as efficient as possible all over the farm, but still on a hand, you know, on a human level, on a human scale production level. You can see 256 seeds in the minute flat with this system. It's a wonderful creation. It's actually 45 years old now and developed for the sugar beet and spring onion industry. And you see, we can actually grow things in the way we want to harvest. These are multi-sown onions that we can grow in bunches that we can harvest and bunch straight away with minimal hand motions in the field. So lots of layers of time and motion studies that we can work with here. Key tools, I'm just going to wrap this up quickly and tell you about our sales to, to be on time for the Q&A. This, I've, I've done a lot of work with manufacturers, testing tools, developing tools, and trying to help others get access to things. Because a lot of us here in Europe are looking to America. We have to import tools from America, and there needs to be you know, more local innovation going on. This is one of the best broad forks I've ever found from a small ironmonger in the UK that I helped made available across Europe. This is what I would call a human-powered keyline plow. For the first three years in heavy soils, we use this in our no dig setup and then they become obsolete. Now, if you put that into the ground, it'll just fall over. Like the soil is beautifully structured from the microbiology. We're microbe farmers. We're farming the things that will grow us lettuces and cabbages. We love as farmers to take credit for all kinds of things, but you know, we don't grow cabbages, we grow soil and soil can grow cabbages and cabbages know how to grow themselves, all right? And we're just using, ergonomic tools everywhere. So something that Elliot Coleman really pushed out and or lots of other market gardeners have is using, you know, the right size tools, 30 inch rakes for 30 inch beds makes sense. If you come along with spend a bit less money and buy a rake that's half as wide, it'll take you twice as long. But twice as long is you finish at dinner time, I finish at lunchtime. So factors of two or more are worth investing in. That's for sure. Simple bed roller for surface compaction or bed marking. And we use a six row cedar from Johnny's in America for all of our high value salad crops and for baby carrots and radish and turnips, stuff like that. Very quick, you can walk at walking speed up and down the bed and an amazing tool. You know, this is $500, $600 tool that saves you incredible amounts of time just in the first year of use. A jang is another great option for folks that have lumpier soil or lumpier compost, then that's better at cutting through thick, lumpy material. And apart from that, we basically use a greens harvester. This is from Farmer's Friends. Uh, this is one of the most profitable crops we grow. It's about $500 net off a 30 foot bed in 42 days. And we have 200 of those beds. You used to have to sit on your hands and knees and cut that with a serrated knife. Now you can harvest that whole bed in two minutes flat and get a really good recut. So little tools like that are indispensable. It's also used for cutting microgreen flats. Simple ergonomic knives, always thinking about the whole picture, right? So an ergonomic push knife for cutting salad heads and broccoli, et cetera, rather than doing this motion 10,000 times a year, 
You know, it's a reason why there's a stereotype of farmers bent over with bad backs, etc. So always finding the right tools for the right jobs. Fancy Japanese tools for pruning, uh, leather, uh, sorry, pruning and trellising tomatoes and cucumbers. And we've just been trying to get these tools available to people in Europe to save people having to ship individually from America, etc. This is just simple four millimeter wire that holds up our row covers, just organized 11 per bed so that everything's handy and where you need it on tool boards right in the middle of the garden. So we're minimizing the amount of walking from A to B. Farming can be described largely as just carrying stuff around from A to B a lot of the time. So putting things in the right place in relation to each other is pretty important. We do a little bit of season extension here with tunnels and tunnels and caterpillar tunnels, which I helped develop with a UK manufacturer based on the farmer's friends model in America. But it just doesn't make sense to ship tunnels across the Atlantic when we can make them here in Europe. But we're limited in our season extension. We're so far north that we can extend the season four or five weeks, but you can't really grow through the winter. It's too dark and too cold. So we're very limited. And there's a nice flip side in that we get a solid five months off, actually, which is, is pretty nice. <laughs> and we make up for it with light till 11 o'clock at night all summer. Uh, very cheap season extension is just simple fleece row covers. You know, you get several degree Celsius increase inside those beds. And then we also use them flat on the ground as a way to hold moisture on the bed to improve germination. And then the extent of our... Uh, pest and disease control is these insect nets. Sweden is plagued by flea beetles and cabbage butterflies. And that's basically all we have to protect against, which the right size micron insect net does a very good job of. But what's been amazing to me to watch is the health of these gardens, as well as the health of, you know, I've been to many no dig gardens are decades old and just the lack of pests and diseases, which is so uncommon to us. You know, if you go to old growth, Forest, you don't see disease and illness. It's very rare. It's nature's recycling mechanism for turning something useless back into plant available nutrients very quickly. But we've grown up in a society where we as humans think of illness as quite normal, but it's not. And I've only seen the only plant illness I've seen is rust spots on beet leaves, which aren't even an issue. So, you know, it's testimony to the soil care that goes on. This garden is built entirely around the wash and pack station. This is where uh, all of the action happens. 40% of the time of a gardener is spent in here. It functions as a garage for parking our car in the winter. And so everything has to have these multiple functions on our farm. Packed veg, uh, sorry, picked and bunched veg is brought here to the wash station where it's washed or dunked if it needs to have heat taken off it. And then it goes into a walk-in chiller at the end of the station here. And then we deliver all our products in these insulated kanga boxes. We can put 12 frozen chickens in and keep them frozen for 12 hours without the need for a uh, diesel or petrol powered refrigerated vehicle. So we'll chill vegetables down and all of our Rico rings, that we, all of our drop off deliveries, they're after lunch. So we always have lunch, take cold vegetables out the chiller, pack them down into their custom orders, straighten the truck, off they go. They're, with a customer within one hour. We have a one hour radius uh, that we sell our products in. We do a bunch of microgreens. I'm just gonna skip over them and uh, save time there. They're very profitable. The most profitable thing you can do in a small space. And it's important one for us in the winters because there's no fresh vegetables available. So it's a good one for customers. And it's also producing a lot of beneficial byproduct for our chickens who are missing the pasture quite uh, dreadfully in the middle of winter. Uh, but that's a little sideline one for us. We live too remotely to do much with microgreens. This is also a low cost enterprise. Now the pond building and irrigation set up a, was a third of the cost of that. So it's a $20,000 enterprise if you don't have to set up your irrigation for tunnels and caterpillar tunnels, row covers, etc. And we get about four and a half euros a square foot of sales excluding the microgreens, but bear in mind, we're really far north. If you're further down, like equivalent to France, UK, Germany, you can do five to $7 a square foot on a bed space like this. Uh, meets EU standards for organics. And yeah, I went to ag school originally looking at tillage based veg production. And it's ironic to think that the very year I left there I made my first no dig setup and I've never 
tilled the soil since, and I don't think I ever would.